Uh, I'm Seth Williams, and we're going to be talking about land investing today. Are there any uh, active land investors in the room right now? Okay. How many of you maybe have heard of land flipping, but you've never really done anything with it? Like you're kind of familiar with the concept? How many of you know nothing about this? Like you've never even heard of it? Okay, cool. Any of you have ever been to RE Tipser before? Are you familiar with the site or? Okay, awesome. Both of you have been there. That's great. <laughs> well, here's a question for you. How many of you like things that are boring? Okay. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm not asking that because I'm wondering if you're going to like this presentation, but I'm asking that because sometimes some of the most important and influential and life-changing things are things that are lackluster and dull and, and boring. And um, today we're going to be talking about a type of real estate that it gets passed over and overlooked by a lot of people, most people really. Uh, but I think it's because they don't know how to step back and see the full business model from end to end of why it makes sense and how it works. And one way to look at this is sort of like a paradigm shift. You guys know what a paradigm shift is? Ever heard of that? Well, I'll give you an example of one. So once upon a time, there was a blind woman and she got onto a crowded bus. And there was standing room only. And there was a man on the bus who saw the blind woman and he gave up his seat to her. So do you think that was a good or a bad thing for him to do? No, it was actually a really, really bad thing. It was so bad he got fired from his job because <laughs> he was a bus driver, all right? So that right there is what we call a paradigm shift. So. You, you thought you knew what was going on, right? You thought you knew this was a good thing, but you didn't know the whole story. You didn't have all the information. And once you did have all the information, it all changed. A good thing became a bad thing. It's kind of like seeing how a magic trick is done, where once you see the illusion, you can't be fooled by it again. And that's what I hope you'll take away today from what we're talking about here. So if we quick uh, rewind the clock back to June 2007, this is me and my wife on our wedding day. And uh, I know, right? <laughs> and, uh, this was one of the happiest days of our lives, but there was sort of this, this lingering issue that you don't see in that picture. She and I used to have a lot of tension. I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I had all these grand dreams to be job free and all this stuff, but she didn't like that. She wanted to just live a normal life, just have an eight to five job, live in a normal house. And that was fine. And every time I would tell her about my dreams to do like house flipping and it was just like, no, don't do that, Seth. You know, she didn't want me to go into debt or hurt us. And in hindsight, like she was kind of right. I didn't know what I was doing. And there was a lot of risk to that, but I felt like she was holding me back and she felt like I was going to hurt us. And it was uh, just this underlying problem that was always there. You know, it was around this time that I discovered the land business. You know, when you guys hear about land, for those of you who are not active land flippers, when you guys hear about land, like, do you see dollar signs flashing? Across? Like when you think of rural dirt, <laughs> is it like, yes, money? Because I, I, didn't, I didn't see that. I didn't see any way to make cash flow or income from dirt out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, especially when I would look at listings on like the MLS, it was like, wow, like why? Like why would anybody do this? This is crazy. One of the big issues with why I didn't see it and why a lot of people don't see the opportunity is because they don't understand how to find deals on land. And this is sort of the key component that makes everything else work. Because uh, if you're looking in the right places, you can find motivated sellers that will sell for prices that like you wouldn't even believe. It's stuff that I had never seen before. You know, if you're looking for properties that have a for sale sign in the front yard or people who have the property listed, that's usually not who you want to talk to because these people, just by nature of the fact that they have a sign like this in their yard, it shows that they care and they understand what it's worth and they actually have an intention of getting that market value out of it. You know, what we want to do is look where nobody else is looking and look where it's not evident. And um, it's getting easier and easier to find these people through things like direct mail, through different data services where we can pull very specific lists. There's even other types of lists that you can get that are harder to get, but very effective. Through this, we can reach out to people and say, hey, I'm looking to buy land. Do you want to sell land? Then give me a call. Or you can send them a, a, an offer on the first piece of mail you send them. And are there any uh, household sailors in the room? Okay. If there were, 
they would probably be like, what, are you serious? Direct mail? Like, no way, that doesn't work. It's because houses are much, much more competitive than land. I mean, it's like a different world. A lot of house wholesalers spend tens of thousands of dollars per month on mail, and sometimes they don't get anything from it. It's just a very saturated business, especially now, like more so than it's ever been. This kind of brings me to the next key attribute of land is that land investors have relatively very little competition to deal with. Back when I got started around 2009, at that point in time, there was no competition, period. Like if I ever made an offer to anybody, there was nobody else that knew about the deal. I wasn't competing with 20 other buyers who were offering over asking price. These days, things are a little bit different. I can't tell you that it's no competition anymore. Other people have definitely caught on and there is competition, but even so, it's far, far different from the world of household selling and pretty much any other type of real estate. You know, if we kind of pull back and figure out why is this, and it's because, uh, or one reason anyway, it's because of all the land in the US, only 6% of that land is developed. And an even smaller percentage of that is like single family homes and multifamily, the types of properties that every real estate investor is going after. And the other 94% is land. And granted, you know, some of that land is public land or farmland, not the kinds of deals a land flipper would go after, but still there is way more land to go around for the handful of land investors out there who are doing this. Another interesting thing about land is that the vast majority of these properties are owned free and clear because for the most part, banks won't really finance vacant residential lots unless there's immediate plan to develop that land. As a result, people who own land have no loans on it. And if you know anything about why that's important is because they have the flexibility to sell for whatever price you and they agree on. There's no bank standing behind them, forcing them to sell for a higher price. And so if you find a motivated seller who's truly apathetic, and believe me, they're out there, you can make incredibly low offers and get them accepted. And there's no bank forcing a higher sale price. Just to make sure we don't gloss over the basics. So one of the best things about land is that it's just land, okay? There's no tenants, there's no contractors to deal with, nothing to repair or replace, nothing gets stolen or destroyed. Property insurance, if you have it at all, is very inexpensive. Property taxes are very inexpensive compared to any kind of improved property because land is really boring. Like it just sits there and nothing happens and it behaves itself. And this is why they don't make TV shows about land flipping is because <laughs> there, there, there's not enough drama to go around and make a show out of. And for us land investors, that's a really good thing. That's what we want to see. So when we talk about a good deal, like what is a good deal anyway, right? Well, this right here is kind of like the land flipping model in one slide. And not all deals look like this, but a lot of them pan out this way. The idea is to figure out, first of all, what is the approximate retail price for this piece of land? And this can be kind of a trick. It's actually much trickier than doing this with houses. But once you have a ballpark idea, what you wanna do is make an offer anywhere from 10 to 40% of market value. It can be higher, it doesn't have to stick to that, but most offers end up being in that range. and if you're talking to the right kind of motivated seller and you get a deal and you buy it free and clear, the beauty of that is the day you buy it, it's worth a lot more than what you paid for it. And you don't have to do anything to it, like nothing. And you can, some people do subdivide, some people will change the zoning, some people do put improvements on it and that will make the value go up even higher, but you don't have to do that. And a lot of land flippers never see their properties with their own eyes because you can Get a lot of the information you need to from things like Google Earth, from data services out there, which we'll talk about uh, in just a minute. And uh, this right here is the first deal I ever did. Just to show you a few real life examples. This was after I sent a few hundred postcards to uh, a county just to the north of me, listed people that all had delinquent taxes on their properties. And I bought this one for 331 bucks. And the seller of the property, he lived in Long Beach, California, the other side of the country. He hadn't seen this in like 20 years. And he was like thrilled that I was interested in buying his property. He wasn't just willing to sell it for 331 bucks. He was overjoyed that he could sell this thing. And I held it for 11 days and I sold it for $1,900. Uh, on Craigslist, not, uh, you know, it's not huge money. It's not the kind of thing you'll quit your job from, but it was like, I did that with no loans. I didn't have a real estate agent. Like I found the deal myself, it was quick. And it was like, what if I just did more of these or did bigger versions of this? And so that's what I did. 
Uh, this one here, this is kind of like a, uh, I guess what I would call an average deal, kind of like a typical base hit. So this was another property that was in Northern Michigan. This was a lady who had inherited a bunch of property from her father who had died. And this is one of those properties. And inherited land is another very common place where deals come from because it was never her passion. It was never her dream. She didn't want it. It just fell into her lap and she didn't know what to do with it. And I made an offer for 2,300 bucks and she accepted it and I sold it for $6,900. And I bought a bunch of other properties from her, from this one postcard she got. This is another fairly normal deal, probably on the better side of average, but still pretty average. And this one was in Alabama. I bought this one for 4,587 bucks and I sold it for 20,000. This one took 15 months for me to sell. And that's the longest I've ever held a property while actively trying to get it sold. One of the hard parts about the land business, for me anyway, is that when I'm trying to sell a property and I'm doing everything right, like I've got a good listing with good pictures, I'm promoting it everywhere, and the buyer just doesn't come. They're not calling. And I'm like, what's wrong? Did I buy a bad property? Did I pay too much? Am I working in the wrong market? In this particular market in Alabama, it was at the time anyway, a pretty slow market for selling land. And that's part of why it took so long. The temptation in these situations is that just lower the price, lower the price, like get somebody to call. And that's what I was doing because I was freaking out. I didn't know why anybody wasn't uh, interested in this. You know, I probably could have sold it for more if I had been willing to wait, but I still made, uh, you know, what is that? 15 grand on this thing. So it, it's kind of a mind game when, when things don't materialize and sell immediately. But in that way, land is kind of like the opposite from houses where with houses, it's really hard to find a deal. And when you do, it sells really quick. And with land, it's, not always the opposite, but often it's a lot easier to find deals and it takes a little longer to sell. Uh, this one right here, this is an example of a great deal. And this is one I've talked about a lot over the years because it was a real light bulb moment and turning point for me, kind of a milestone. So this was uh, 12 acres with uh, 500 feet of beach frontage on Lake Huron, right by the Mackinac Bridge up in Northern Michigan. And uh, I bought this one for 4,500 and sold it for 45,000. And it took me five months to do that. And this was the first property I ever bought and sold that I, I never saw with my own eyes. I used to go out and like visit my property just because it made me feel better. But every time I did that, it was like, okay, there's some, some dirt. Great, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but that's one of the cool things is once I realized that could be done, it's like, well, I guess I don't need to work in Michigan at all anymore because I don't need to ever see these things. This property actually had some issues that I didn't even know until after I bought it. I kind of got lazy on my due diligence, but most of this property was not buildable because it had wetland areas on it and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers had access to it because Lake Huron is a federal body of water. And a lot of it wouldn't pass a perk test, which allows you to put a septic system in place. And if you can't have a septic system, then you can't have a house, which means it's not buildable, which means the value goes way down. But luckily we found a spot right in there where it passed the perk test. So it was buildable. And you might be looking at something like this and thinking, like, why do people do this? Like, surely this lady must have known, the person who sold it, that it was worth more than 4,500 bucks, right? And there's always sort of a story behind this stuff. In this case, this lady had bought this with her husband and they were planning to build their dream home on it. And out of the blue, her husband just left her just for no reason. And for her, this thing was like a painful memory and she wanted it gone. And when I talked to her on the phone, it was very clear. She knew it was worth more than that. And even when she went to sign closing documents with the title company, my dumb title company was trying to convince her, you know, this is worth a lot more than that, right? <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and she's told them, yeah, I know. I just want it out of my life. You know, it's one of those things where it's different than a house, where when you're trying to buy a house from somebody, there's, it's the roof over somebody's head, you know? Like, there's a lot more emotion tied to that. Um, I've got a couple other deals. I'm going to kind of just skip over here just for the sake of time. So the reason I show you all this is that this is a very small drop in the ocean of opportunity of the land business. And let me be very clear about something, all right? I'm not the biggest, I'm not the best. I'm just one guy who's always done this business on a part-time basis. And I know people who do deals in the hundreds of thousands, sometimes in the millions, because they've got a lot more money behind them. They're willing to go after that kind of stuff. They have time to put everything they have into it. And that stuff is out there. And what I'm showing you here is just, what somebody was able to do with 3,000 bucks to start with. I had very little money when I got started. And like I said, it's, it's always been a part-time thing for me. And you might wonder like, why not do it full-time, Seth? That this is so great. And for me, the reason is because there's a lot of other stuff I wanna do with my life. One of the nice things about the land business is that 
it allows you to do that. You know, a lot of businesses out there require hundreds of thousands just to open the door and make your first dollar of revenue. And they require everything from you. In land, you can use whatever time and money you have and really make something out of it. So uh, let's talk about how we find these people, right? And why would somebody want to give away their property for a fraction of what it's worth? And uh, it all starts with understanding what makes a landowner motivated to sell. Like what situations lead an owner to a place where they're not just willing to let it go, but they're happy to do that. And um, I've found with vacant land, most of the time they fall into one of four buckets. First one is they have delinquent taxes. And when I got started, this was specifically what I went after. Because remember with land, people have 100% equity and there are no mortgage payments they have to make. So if anything is gonna be past due, it's gonna be their taxes. I'm gonna talk more about this one in just a minute. I won't get too far on that one. Uh, another common reason is they inherited the property. So it was never really their passion or desire in the first place. And they don't really care about it. Uh, another reason is there's some kind of a big life-changing event. Like they got divorced or somebody died or there was a big financial event for better or worse. And all of a sudden this property doesn't matter anymore. And it's a nuisance and it's got to go. Uh, another common issue is just a change of plan. So, and this, I get come across this all the time where people bought land like five or 10 or 20 years ago with this dream of like building their dream cottage on it or park parking their RV there. But after they buy the thing, reality kind of sets in and they realize like, I'm probably actually not gonna do that. And I don't have time to do that. And now I have this land and what do I do with it? And it's a tax bill I have to pay every, every year. And again, it's kind of just in the way and they wanna move on. So on the issue of delinquent taxes, so the first type of list I ever start, by the way, this is a, a QR code. I have a blog post explaining everything about this. If you scan that, it'll take you there. But the delinquent tax list is something that I found to be pretty effective. It's a list that every county has where they keep track of who is delinquent on their taxes. And this is different from the tax sale list. That's a very important distinction. So the people on this list, they still own their property. They still have the power to sell it to whoever they want but the taxes are back due. And if they don't pay them off soon, they're gonna lose everything. And the reason this makes a lot of sense to contact these people is because everybody on this list has kind of a red flag. For one reason or another, they're not paying their taxes. And if they don't, they're gonna lose it. And it's, it's a much more compelling thing to say, look, you're about to lose it all, or you can take a few hundred or a few thousand dollars from me. What would you rather have? And uh, I found it to be pretty, um, pretty responsive. The problem with this kind of list though, I don't want to oversimplify this. A lot of these lists are very difficult to get. And even when you do get them, they're a total mess to sort through. And if you're starting from where I was starting, where I had $3,000, but I did have time to deal with those issues, this can be a great place to start. What a lot of people do though, is eventually, if they even bother with this at all, they move on to a data service. And there's a you know, actually a lot of different data services out there. By the way, there's another blog post that'll explain exactly how I do what I'm about to say here. But um, a data service basically allows you to filter very specific types of properties and property owners in any county in the country or most counties in the country. The one that I use is called DataTree. I like it, but there's other ones like PropStream and ListSource and RealQuest. And they all do kind of the same general thing. For example, you could filter... I want everybody in this state, in this county, who owns this type of land that's this size, in this value, with this zoning, and get hyper-specific about it. I think a lot of times these kinds of lists have a, maybe a lower response rate, lower acceptance rate, because they don't have that delinquent tax issue or other, some, other, some other issue in, in common. But the nice thing about this is that you can scale it and you can waste a lot less time on dealing with messes that you get from the county. So. RE Tipster has affiliate relationships with two of them, DataTree and PropStream. And if you guys are interested, you can get discounted access to either one through these QR codes as well. I'll leave that on the screen for just a second. But when it comes to the whole issue of monetizing land, so the business model that I've always followed is simply flipping it, you know, just buying it and selling it, just move on. It's nice because I don't have to do anything, but if you're able to master the art of finding these deals, there's a lot of opportunity. There's lots of different ways that you can monetize your land. I made a, uh, a video a few years ago on YouTube that kind of got pretty popular about seven ways to make a thousand bucks per month from land. And uh, I'm just gonna quick review some of those ideas just to get the wheels turning. Because remember, if you can master the art of finding deals, there's lots of ways you can, uh, you can play this. So one is you could lease your land to hunters. Uh, another idea is to throw an RV or a tiny house or even a glamping tent on your property and lease it out by the night on Airbnb. 
Or if you don't want to mess with owning an RV, you can just rent out the vacant lot, just the dirt, and people can bring their own RVs. You can do this with a website called Hip Camp. And uh, the people I know who do this make anywhere from like 35 to 50 bucks per night from their vacant land. So like it's not huge money, but like what if you could get 10 or 20 of those things and it's just dirt. Another option is to convert your land into an outdoor boat and RV storage facility. This one does require a bit more upfront cost to like put a fence on it and level out the ground and put gravel down. But uh, once it's done, it doesn't take a whole lot of work to keep this thing going. Uh, another one is if you have a land that is fairly flat and it's within walking distance of a point of interest, like a ballpark or a zoo or some other attraction that draws big crowds, you could do nothing and just use it as a parking lot. Has anybody here ever been to Detroit? Okay, why? <laughs> well, I can say that because I'm from Michigan, but so I, I do know a guy who owns a few vacant lots in inner city Detroit. And at first you'd be like, why? Like, who would want to own land there? But he actually uses his lots as uh, little parking lots right near Comerica Park where the Detroit Tigers play. And he's making like a thousand bucks per night per lot on game nights. So. You could also lease it out to a clean energy company. And this one's a little bit more involved because the property has to fit a pretty specific profile. But if it does, it can be a pretty huge moneymaker. A lot of farmers will do this when they lease out a small portion to like a wind turbine company. Uh, another one is to uh, lease out a portion of your land to an outdoor advertising company. If your property is zoned commercial, you could contact a company like Lamar or Viacom or Clear Channel or CBS Outdoor, and they can build their own billboard and literally do everything. Like you don't touch any of it and they will pay you an annual lease amount and sometimes even a portion of their ad revenue. Honestly, like you don't even need a vacant land for this. If you have any commercial building where there's enough traffic going by the, the uh, property and the state doesn't have any like laws against it, that's another viable option as well. You could also put uh, a cell phone tower on your property. As you can see now, they're making them look like trees. And uh, I know one lady who is renting out, or she has a 50 year lease with a cell phone company for 600 square feet of her land. And she's getting 21,000 bucks a year from that. And that's nothing she has to do, just leasing the land out that way. Or the original type of land lease, which is just farming. You could uh, lease it to a farmer. And I will say, if you're trying to go specifically after agricultural property that's actively being worked, it's a lot harder to find super cheap deals on that because that property is making money for somebody. And there's a lot less motivation to sell. But uh, another option would be to find land and develop it into farmland. And the cost I've seen on that is about 2000 bucks an acre, but it kind of depends on what's on that land and what has to be done. But, and there's also uh, seller financing. And uh, there's a lot to be said about seller financing. I'm probably not gonna hit it all, but I'll just mention it. So with the land business, again, because banks don't lend on many types of vacant land, if you as the seller are willing to accept payments for that instead of selling it cash, you open up the opportunity to a lot more people. So, you know, if you're selling for cash and you have a $50,000 lot, the only people who can buy that are people with 50,000 bucks in their bank account. But by financing it, you can sell it for more, you can charge interest, you can create recurring sources of income. You know, for a normal landowner who paid full market value, this would not be a very enticing proposition because all their money's tied up in it. But remember, if we're paying 20 to 30% of the property's value, what if you just ask for that on your down payment and got pure profit for the next five years? And that's what a lot of people do. And if you got a handful or a dozen or 20 or 30 of those going, I mean, you can get a five figure monthly paycheck coming in pretty regularly. And that's what a lot of people do. And um, everything that I've just told you is true, but there's also some downsides to seller financing as well. One of the downsides is that inevitably you're gonna have people who stop paying you. It's not a disaster because you can get that property back and resell it and get paid for it all over again, but it's a hassle, you know? Personally, I don't like it. I'd rather just know that I'm gonna get paid and not get the rug pulled out from under me, but that's the thing you have to be ready to deal with. Also, the cash flow doesn't last forever. It's not like a rental property because these are all gonna pay off eventually. And if you want that cash flow to keep coming in, you gotta keep buying and selling more. You do have to figure out a way to manage and keep track of all the payments and uh, send out late notices when you need to and that kind of thing. And it can be done. There's solutions and ways to do with this with software and loan servicing companies, but still it's, it's stuff that you wouldn't have to even think about if you were just doing cash. So seller financing is a little easier in some states than others because some states make it a lot harder to get your property back when a person stops paying you. You can always do it, but 
It's a matter of like, is it a judicial court process or can I just send in a few papers and get it back? So those are just things to think about if you decide to go down the seller financing path. My point with mentioning all these ideas is just to kind of drive home the point that if you can get a property for super cheap, it's not hard to make money on that property. The same thing could be true for cars or, or jewelry or gold or stocks or bonds. If you could buy any of this stuff at a fraction of what it's really worth, you can make money pretty easily. But uh, the thing with land is there is a systematizable, repeatable process that you can use to do this. And there's, as we saw, a lot of land investors in this room who can vouch for that. It's not just me saying this. And uh, you know, something I, I want you to take away from this is that deals are all over the place. They're in every single market. But again, they're not gonna be from the people who have a for sale sign in their front yard. They don't think like you and me do. These are people who have a situation or a mindset. And if you can find them and make it easy for them, you can get a deal. And um, if you remember what I said earlier about my wife who never wanted me to do any of this scary real estate stuff. So the funny thing is, when she saw what was possible with land, she like miraculously changed her mind. She like didn't, <laughs> she didn't have all these like hesitations and fear and something I don't want you to take away from this is that land investing is easy because it's not. I will say that relative to everything else I've ever tried in real estate, it's easier, but it's not easy. There's still risks to deal with. There's challenges, there's uncertainty. It is possible to send out direct mail and not get responses. And that's a tough pill for some people to swallow. And it's really annoying and disappointing when that happens. But even so though, when you compare it to every other real estate investing strategy out there, again, that I have seen, it's simpler than the vast majority of things out there. You know, let me just reiterate here that uh, there's nothing special about me or my story, right? I'm, I'm not the best, I haven't seen it all. Even with all of my self-inflicted mental limitations and fears about how this business works, I was still able to make it work on my nights and weekends, and I was able to make it a six-figure business, uh, more than I was making from my day job. You know, in some cases, people have competitive advantages where they are willing to rezone and subdivide and that kind of thing, and that can certainly help. But um, even if you just buy a great deal and do nothing to it, money can be made that way. The reason I'm up here is not because I'm like the most successful land investor on the planet. It's because I have a deep passion for explaining this stuff to people. And I know what it feels like to be stuck, right? I'm, I'm intimately familiar with struggle and beating my head against the wall and trying things that don't work. I tried a lot of different businesses before land that failed. And uh, honestly, like in general, it's hard to make money in this life. Like there are struggles in any business out there. And when I finally found what was possible with land, it was such a, a life-changing thing. It continues to be life-changing to this day. You know, ever since I started writing on my website, retipster.com back in 2012, and just talking about my experiences, what was working for me, what wasn't working for me, I've just gotten like this steady stream of amazing feedback from people who quit their job or pay off their student loans or buy their car, or whatever. I mean, fill in the blank. It's an amazing thing to be able to see what I experienced play out through other people. Honestly, I can't think of many more fulfilling ways to spend my working life than kind of helping other people see, see the light like I did. So let me ask you about you. Do you, think, do you think you could make money from a vacant lot that you paid 20% of its market value for? Or uh, could you handle the complexity and the stress of owning a piece of dirt in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> maybe, or maybe not. I'm not gonna say this business is for everybody, but if I could figure it out, there's a good chance you can do it too. If you wanna learn more, there's a few ways I'll just mention here. So go to retipster.com, but not just retipster.com. We have a land investing category. On retipster, we write about a lot of stuff. It's not all land, but that QR code will take you to the land investing section where you can see all of our land investing content. We have spent thousands and thousands and thousands of hours into making this stuff. And a lot of blogs on the internet are kind of just like noise machines. I don't really know why they do it, honestly, but every time we publish anything, it's done through the mindset of this needs to be worth paying for, but it's free. So if you decide to go there, brace yourself, be prepared to be amazed by what you find, because <laughs> I think you will be. You can also go check out the RE Tipster YouTube channel. So similarly, we've spent tons of time making some great videos on here. 
A lot of these videos are embedded in the blog posts on RE Tipster, but some of them aren't. So you'll find a lot of great information here, lots of reviews on the stuff that we're using, interviews with other people. Some of the people are right here in this room about what has worked for them and how they've found success. Also, if you're looking for a community of other people that uh, talks about this stuff and is actively doing it, we've got a Facebook group and a forum. Both are free. And uh, these are really awesome groups. Like people in here have the heart to help. They're for you, they're very giving. And if they're not, we kick them out. So it's uh, just great communities. I've learned a ton of stuff just by like observing and hearing what other people are talking about. Lastly, if you're looking for a course that gives you everything you need to know, A to Z, I spent eight years of my life making this. I update it every single month. It's not a cheap course. And uh, I'm not gonna apologize for that because it's the best course out there on this, but this is just more compact, organized version of that. And uh, that's all I've got. I appreciate you guys pretending to listen to me this whole time. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm going to be around the rest of the weekend. And yeah, I'd love to talk to you. Thanks. <laughs>